massive explosion destroys a quiet neighborhood. Police find the racist messages in the ruins of one house. Its owners are a quiet, God-fearing couple who has targeted them for death. Who has scrawled the warning? We have your keys. We'll lock up. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Puritans of Boston believed that we lived surrounded by an invisible world of satanic demons looking for any chance to burn us with a hateful touch. Their invisible hands reaching into our hearts. Exhibit A. This hate letter, written in a hand that would betray the criminal behind a monstrous deed. It's a soft May evening in the suburbs of Toronto, 1995. Without warning, a massive explosion obliterates four homes and damages dozens of others on a quiet street. Residents report that for 15 seconds following the blast, they cannot breathe. The explosion has sucked all the oxygen into its vortex. A column of flame leaps 100 feet into the sky and fragments of the destroyed houses land a mile from the blast center. It was quite a shock. I heard this enormous explosion and then followed shortly by a pressure wave that sort of knocked me off my feet. I uh, saw that there was frame members and parts of a roof accelerating uh, above the horizon of my street about 14, 12, 1400 feet. Uh, immediately went in and tried to phone 911, uh, but the trunk lines were full. In a terrifying instant, a community is torn apart. Investigators fear they'll find a massive number of dead and injured in the debris. My God, there, there's gonna be so many dead bodies. Look at the devastation from this huge explosion. It was a chaotic scene. People aimlessly wandering around in a daze, not knowing what to do. The firemen were racing to put the fire out and people were just stunned. Two neighboring couples, the Gallants and the Gordons, are unaccounted for. The bomb squad and the fire department determine from the pattern of the blast debris that the center of the explosion is the Gordon home. And there's something even more explosive found in the rubble of their house. As officers came uh, looking for uh, bodies and looking for injured people, they're virtually standing on the evidence. And when an officer looked down and saw a swastika on a panel of a garage door, he realized there's something here. The discovery of the racist graffiti in the Gordons' home immediately brings Steve Irwin of the Hate Crimes Unit into the investigation. We look and say, is it an organized group? Is it an Oklahoma bombing that someone is now starting in our city? Someone has got this bright idea of this is a great way to make a statement. Because the community at large is then at great risk. Investigators work to recover evidence from the charred wreck of the Gordon's basement. They are anxious to examine anything that might provide a clue to the cause of the explosion. Seven pieces of broken pipe are sent to the Center of Forensic Sciences for examination. 
gas pipes from the house were brought to me. They're uh, different sizes of pipes coming right from the gas meter on the outside of the house all the way over to the hot water heater and the furnace. And of those seven sections of pipes, two of them had suspicious cuts. And this is a close look at the cut surface of the pipe and there's fine lines running across the cut surface indicating that it was a cut surface and not a broken surface from something like a hacksaw, the teeth leaving marks in the pipe surface as it's going through it. The hacksaw went all the way through the pipe from one side to the other, opening it up completely and allowing a gas to blow into the room. Now police know what caused the explosion. It wasn't an accident or a bomb. It was an intentional leak of natural gas. Despite the size of the blast, it's a miracle that no one has been killed. The Glants were out for dinner when their house was destroyed, and the Gordons were in Niagara Falls for the weekend. On their return Sunday night, the Gordons are intercepted by a police roadblock at the end of their street, still unaware that their lives have changed forever. Mr. and Mrs. Gordon are escorted to a police station where they meet lead investigator, Detective Wilson. He breaks the news about the destruction of their house and about the racist graffiti. Wilson and Constable Keeley are determined to help the Gordons in every way they can. They were quite surprised. They couldn't believe who would do this to us. They weren't public people, public figures, they were private people. And they just couldn't believe uh, they were awestruck about uh, the whole situation and the whole subdivision is gone. After they spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Gordon, they found them to be a couple of upright standing citizens, uh, a couple of um, hard-working individuals, a very quiet man, a church-going man. A compassionate neighbor offers the Gordons a space, a temporary shelter from the storm, a place to begin putting their lives back together. David Gordon has his own heating and cooling business. Mrs. Gordon is a nurse at a local hospital. They are deeply religious. Who can possibly hate the Gordons enough to blow up their house? Police have no suspects in the baffling destruction of the Gordon's house, an act with the ugly stain of a hate crime. They receive their first lead when a 14-year-old high school student is caught writing a chilling message on the wall of his school washroom. He wrote a confession that how he put a device on the pipe and he blew up this house and caused all this damage and he's very sorry. Detective Wilson questions the boy at great length. He's troubled and upset about his life at school. He's looking for attention, but he didn't blow up the Gordon's house. The overwhelming devastation of the Gordon's neighborhood, combined with the hate crime element, has made this a very hot story. The Gordons are swamped by the media. The police encourage Gordon to appeal for information on local TV news. The television appeal for help pays off when investigators receive a tip pointing them to a nasty piece of work named George Stryker. Stryker is a member of a motley but potentially dangerous gang of white supremacists called Aryan Fist. Police discover that Stryker also has a record of petty break and enters and he loves to fight. What you'll see from them is graffiti. You'll also see the clothing and the tattoos that, that identify their ideology or philosophy, the white supremacist uh, sort of ideology or beliefs. Stryker and his thugs fit the profile of a gang that could commit a serious hate crime. But when investigators check him out, they quickly realize that Stryker isn't smart enough to blow much more than hot air. And besides, he was in juvenile detention the night the Gordon's house was destroyed. As suspects are eliminated, 
Steve Irwin starts to examine the exact nature of the hate messages written inside the Gordon's garage. Something in the way one of the messages is worded catches his eye. All minority is on death list. It's unusual that their specific backgrounds aren't brought into it and the word minority, it's a very clean word. Uh, we often use the word politically correct. So for a hate monger, a white supremacist group to use the word minority, it just, it sort of jumps out. The police are now beginning to wonder whether this was a hate crime at all. So who else could have done this? An unhappy customer? Or maybe even a vengeful neighbor? A canvas of the neighborhood turns up no new leads. But police begin to examine David Gordon's private life more closely. And what they find spins the investigation off in a whole new direction. Gordon is a longtime member of the Worldwide Church of God, a religious group that suffered a bitter split after the death of its founder, Herbert Armstrong. Investigators call on Jim Beverly, an expert on new religions, to help them understand how the teachings of the church might affect Gordon. The Worldwide Church of God for a while was one of the most well-known groups in North America because they sent the plain truth free to people all over the world. And one of their leaders, Garner Ted Armstrong, was on Saturday television telling us about the world tomorrow. Ever since Herbert started uh, his church in 1934, he was uh, addicted to prophecy. David Gordon had requested to be ordained a minister by the conservative branch of the church. When he was refused, Gordon became furious. Angry letters were exchanged. Could someone in the worldwide Church of God be trying to silence David Gordon violently? He would be taught by Mr. Armstrong that we're living near the end of the world and he believed he had special revelation uh, for preparing the church as it faces the battles with Satan at the end of time. He was asking the church to make radical moves to ordain him and just break the traditional pattern of ordination and he thought that God and Jesus had made an exception in his case and that the uh, future of the church hinged on the leaders in California accepting his calling to ministry. David Gordon's life is much more complex than detectives first thought. The investigation of his life takes a leap forward when police search Gordon's work van. What we find to our surprise is garbage bags. And in the garbage bags, there's personal mementos. Pictures of the children when they were young, all Mr. Gordon's. Contrary to what the police first believed, David Gordon's business is failing badly. He's claiming over $300,000 in insurance, and he seems to know to the penny what every item in his house was worth. A forensic accountant discovers that the Gordons had been living far beyond their means. Is this an insurance scam? Would the hope of collecting insurance money be enough to make him destroy his own home and devastate an entire neighborhood? Have demons of greed possessed the soul of David Gordon? It's now June, two months since the explosion that leveled David Gordon's house and neighborhood. Every day, investigators Wilson and Keeley ask themselves the same question. Who could possibly have done this, if not David Gordon himself? Every new piece of evidence seems to point right back to Gordon. The hate message is written on the inside of the garage door, an odd location for racist graffiti. The deliberately cut gas pipes in the basement. The family mementos safely stored in the van. Mr. Gordon was brought into the station somewhere towards the end of June. 
Detective Wilson cautioned him at the time because he believed that he no longer was an innocent victim, that he was a suspect and he's being investigated as the person who blew up his house. Still, the evidence against Gordon is all circumstantial, and he was an hour and a half away when the blast happened. One hate letter sent to the police contains three keys one of which fits the Gordon's garage door lock. We have your keys. We'll lock up. Signed, The Underground. They introduced this group, The Underground, as the group responsible for this explosion. Um, we, of course, from intelligence, the hate crime unit, started to pursue that and determine, is this a group that's known somewhere else? Is it a group in another part of the world that now has some members? here in Toronto. Is it a group that is evolving? Is it a splinter group or a new group? The letters contain an important clue, the handwriting of the criminal, handwriting that looks like it's been intentionally disguised. Usually in disguise, what the writer does is try to disguise the way the writing looks. That means a change in slant, a change in size, a change in the more obvious letter forms. You want to make them look as different as possible, but what doesn't change usually is the habitual things that you don't think about. How you cross your T's, where you start your O's. Those things that you do without thinking about are not easily disguised. When I saw this first, I knew immediately that it was disguised, and when you see something like, like this that's so heavily disguised, you do know that there's very little chance that you're going to identify it unless you have another disguised writing that's been somehow linked to the, uh, to the writer of the knowns. Investigators have examples of Gordon's writing from the letters he wrote to the church. They also have the hate mail written in a disguised hand. Now they need to know for certain whether or not Gordon is writing the hate mail himself. Police plan a sting. They'll play on Gordon's desire to collect the house insurance, hoping to make him betray himself. We went in and said that unless we get more hate mail, more evidence, we can't close this case right away. So we're in a bit of a dilemma, and yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Gordon, but you're going to have to wait for a bit uh, till we resolve this issue and we sort of laid the seed, as it were. And he took it. The next day, we had surveillance on him for 24 hours a day. Officers watch as Gordon notes the street address of the police station. They follow him to a residential mailbox. He had a rolled up newspaper and he had his hate mail letters in the rolled up newspaper and he sort of looked around and made sure anybody wasn't looking. Opened the box door up and sort of jiggled the paper, let the envelopes fall in and walked away to his truck. Police seize the letters from the mailbox. Using only the second DNA warrant ever obtained in Canada, they take a blood sample from David Gordon. They'll compare it with the DNA lifted from the stamps on the envelopes from the mailbox. But police still don't have enough to make a solid case until they can link the two sets of letters. You can see that the, um, the one on top is the known sample. You can see that uh, the words Metropolitan Toronto Police are very similar in letter form and construction and uh, just a general style of writing. If you look in particular at the word Toronto at the top, 
you can see that the letter forms are all very similar. Again, farther down, the word metropolitan. Below that, if you look at, um, at the M, if you look at the P, certainly they're very similar in letter form and in writing style. The agreement was dynamic. There was no fundamental differences. Um, I have no doubt that the writer of those letters wrote the question letters as well. The lab reports come back. Gordon's DNA matches the DNA found on the hate letter stamps. Police finally have the proof they need to arrest David Gordon. And they have a theory about what happened the day of the explosion. David Gordon was a gas fitter. It was part of his business as a furnace installer. He knew exactly where to cut the gas lines so the house would fill with an explosive concentration of natural gas. And he knew it would take long enough for him to be a safe distance away from the inevitable explosion. It was truly a miracle that no one was killed. We'll never know the exact detonation. It could be something as simple as the freezer or the refrigerator coming on. If he hadn't wrote those letters, I don't think we've ever arrested him. We would have a strong suspicion to think, yes, that man did it. But was there enough evidence to take him before a court of law? I don't think so. It was the letters that was his undoing. His own hate letters finally betrayed him to police. But it was Gordon's letters to the Worldwide Church of God that best revealed his twisted motivation. I would say in Mr. Gordon's case, there was a dance going on between his religious background, his beliefs, and he's the one to lead the church in the end times. He's talking to God, he's getting visions. Satan and the demons are under his control. And in the end, you get the terrible results of him taking the law into his own hands, blowing his house up, probably for money, and then not admitting his crime to his fellow citizens. David Gordon was sentenced to 11 years in prison for arson, endangering life, and hate crimes. The invisible hand of evil that reached into his community and his home was his own. He became the prophet of his own apocalypse when his religious aspirations became demonic possession. The stories on Exhibit A are based on true cases. The forensic scientists and investigators are the actual individuals who worked on each case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the guilty are real.